uh, they wanted to destroy the family unit. In fact, the family unit was the last vestige of, of um, power which would stand up collectively against uh, uh, too much intrusion by an elite. And so it had to, the family had to go. Once that was destroyed, then the state became supreme ruler directly to the individual, which we see today. Uh, m many women now, uh, probably over half, have uh, are single parent families, and there's generally social workers from the state uh, involved in their lives all the time, concerning the rearing of their children or removing of their children. And this again is uh, was planned and discussed freely by guys like Bertrand Russell back in the 1800s, um, uh, Margaret Mead and and Havelock Ellis and so on. Um, so this, 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 was, this was a big, rich club, you see, of, of rich elitists. Um, in Darwin and the Minds of Men, it says uh, Mead and Benjamin Spock, um, between, between them, the pattern of North, North American child rearing was radically changed and the fruits of their labors are now becoming evident in today's divorce statistics. Mead's own modest contribution to these statistics consisted of having three husbands, uh, which would seem to refute the promise of a happy and graceful life she claimed science showed to be possible with a liberated sexual lifestyle. Ironically for both science and alleged happy life, Mead, one of America's leading scientists and a, purport a purported Christian, uh, died in 1978 in the arms of a psychic faith healer. So another little clue that pops in down through the ages with reading all these guys is they're all Masons or Eastern stars for the females. They all believe in the same um, channeling experiences from entities, uh, and, and they, they, they front for Christian organizations. That's their cover. Uh, Bertrand Russell espoused the total Masonic doctrine of evolution and great purpose behind it, meaning a great power, the grand architect of the universe. And, and Mead was into the uh, fortune telling and, and palm reading and, um, and channeling, of course. So these are the these are these are the, the heroes who helped change society, which they claimed for the was for the better. So let's go back to another book of Bertrand Russell, and this one is called uh, The Impact of Science on Society. Um, this was a, a, a treatise, really, on population control on one level, and it was also a treatise on uh, methods of, of creating population control. Uh, what I'm going to read here, and this book was initially written or published, I believe, in, let me see, 1952. Uh, this, this now is, is, is a good part of what became known as the, the Earth Charter that Maurice Strong put forward. And, of course, it was one of the, the Rockefellers who actually wrote it for Maurice Strong. But in reality, Bertrand Russell put all this stuff down in the 1950s. He said, um, let us now bring together the conclusions which result from an inquiry into the various kinds of conditions that a scientific society must fulfill if it is to be stable. Now, he's talking about a society controlled by scientists, a world run by experts. He says, first, as regards uh, physical conditions, soil and raw materials must not be used up so fast that scientific progress cannot continually make the loss by means of new inventions and discovering. Scientific progress is therefore a condition, not merely of social progress, but even of maintaining the degree of prosperity already achieved. Given a stationary technique, the raw materials that it requires will be used up in no very long time. If raw materials are not to be used up too fast, there must not be free competition for their acquisition and use but an international authority to ration them in such quantities as may from time to time seem compatible with continued industrial prosperity. And similar conditions apply to soil, soil conservation. Now here, that which got written into the Earth Charter and then into 
the Agenda 21 from the UN Charter. Um, and, and now we find out that Bertrand Russell's writing it in the 1950s. And if we go back to, to his friend that he mentions earlier, um, his, his particular uh, friendship with, um, let me see here, uh, John Stuart Mills, the economist in the 1800s, this is the same thing. It's just reiterated over and over again. They had the plan made up in the 1800s to do exactly that's what they're talking about here. Um, he goes on in uh, The Impact of Science on Society, Bertrand Russell. Second, as regards population, if there is not to be a permanent and increasing shortage of food, agriculture must be conducted by methods which are not wasteful of soil. An increase in population must not outrun the increase in food production rendered possible by technical improvements. At present, neither condition is fulfilled. The population of the world is increasing and its capacity for food production is diminishing. Such a state of affairs obviously cannot continue very long without producing a cataclysm. Now, of course, this is all nonsense. And then we can go back even further to the 1700s where the precursor of John Stuart Mill was uh, Malthus, who also was an economist for the British East India Company, who did, dealt with the very same nonsense and, and was always shouting, uh, 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 fear, 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 above no food, and the population is just uh, going out of proportions. And he printed his book on population control, uh, this is Malthus, uh, two years before the British uh, did its first census. So he even quoted fake figures for his book, because it hadn't been done yet, the census, that is. Um, back to the impact of science on society by Bertrand Russell. To deal with this problem, it will be necessary to find ways of preventing an increase in world population. If this is to be done otherwise than by wars, pestilences, and famines, it will demand a powerful international authority. My God, we hear the same thing over and over, eh? This authority should deal out the world's food to the various nations in proportion to their population at the time of the establishment of the authority. If any nation subsequently increases its population, it should not on that account receive any more food. The motive for not increasing population would therefore be very compelling. What method of preventing an increase might be preferred should be left to each state to decide. That each state is each country. Um, it's interesting that this written in the 1950s became a part of Agenda 21, pretty well word for word which tells you this is an old plan run by the same people, the same elite group down through the ages. Uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, and I'll try and find it here, and this is all off the cuff pretty well, by the way, nothing's rehearsed here. Um, uh, okay, he, he goes on in uh, page 116 of the impact of science on society. He said... Um, are mere members too so important that, for their sake, we should patiently permit such a state of affairs to come about? Surely not. What then can we do? Apart from certain deep-seated prejudices, the answer would be obvious. The nations which at present increase rapidly should be encouraged to adopt the methods by which the West, in the West, the increase of population has been checked. The increase of population has been checked. Now remember that statement there. Now how did they check the population increase in the West? Uh, because it was at that time in the 1800s, right through, they started inoculations. And if you follow the, the statistics of the British, British Medical Association, who did careful follow-ups on all those who were inoculated, everybody who was inoculated against these particular diseases died of them. <laughs> 